I saw some heads bobbing there. You all recognize that, huh? Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. So this morning, we are, we're continuing our sermon series. Uh, we titled it, Get Out of Babylon. Last week, I talked about how Babylon refers to a, a system of principles and norms and values that characterize the ancient city of Babylon. But those same systems and norms and values that prevailed in the historical Babylon that existed thousands of years ago are the same values, the same norms that, that govern the world that we live in today. And those values are summarized in these verses of Scripture. First John, the second chapter and the 15th verse says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, turn to your neighbor, say everything in the world. It says, for everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, they come not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires will pass away, but whoever does the will of God, the Bible says, lives forever. These three things drive the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The world revolves around the satisfaction of these things. But James chapter 4 and verse 4 says, don't you realize, touch your number, say, don't you realize. It says, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God. I say it again. If you want to be a friend of the world, you will make yourself an enemy of God. Every time you see the world in a Bible verse, I want you to know that the Bible is not referring to the geographical earth, but that the Bible is referring to the systems, to the values, to the way of doing things in the world. And the scriptures we have just read says, you cannot be a friend of God and do things the way that the world does things. The Bible says you are living a life that is at war with God. You are living a life that is uh, 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 in opposition to God when you do things the way that the people of the world do things. When your life is governed by the principles that govern the world, when you think like the folks in the world, when you behave like the folks in the world, when you act like the folks in the world, the Bible says you are the enemy of God. And at the root of, of some of the, of the struggles that we have with the world, is that we are afraid, we, we, we live in fear that the world will mock us, that the world will reject us, that our friends or even our family will reject us if we do not live the way that they live, if we do not drink the way that they drink, if we do not sleep around like they sleep around, if we don't chase after money like they chase after money, if we don't dress like they dress, if we don't talk like they talk, if we're not dropping the F-bomb and the B-bomb and the M-bomb and God knows whatever bombs they're dropping, if we don't live like that, then they, they look at us funny and we don't want that. We are afraid of that. We do everything we can to avoid standing out. So we try to conform. In Psalm 27 verse 10, the Bible says, Even if my father and my mother abandon me, Hallelujah. the Lord will hold me close. If my friends laugh at me, if my father, my mother, if they laugh at me, if they reject me, I have a promise Hallelujah. from the Lord Amen. that he would hold me close. Amen. In Romans chapter 12, the Bible says, Do not be conformed to the world. Do not be like the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We need to get out of a Babylonian mindset. I would rather be at war with the world or with the devil than be the enemy of God. You see, when God is your enemy, there's no witness protection that can hide you. Amen? There, you, you cannot hide from God. He will find you. He knows your name. He knows your address. He knows your social security number. Right. Hallelujah. So you cannot hide from God. Amen? Amen? So the last thing you want is to be the enemy of God. The Bible says in Matthew 10, 28, it says, don't be afraid of those who, who want to kill your body. They cannot touch your soul. Fear only God 
who can destroy both soul and body and soul and body in hell. That is why you and I need to separate ourselves from the Babylonian way of thinking. Amen. You know, last week we looked at the lust of the flesh, which we defined very simply as the need to satisfy the cravings of our bodies and our emotions. When we are driven by our bodies or our emotions, we are being driven, the Bible says, by the lust of the flesh. This morning, I want to look at the lust of the eyes. Amen? Amen. Let's turn our Bibles very quickly to Joshua, the seventh chapter. The second verse. Joshua, the seventh chapter and the second verse. It says, And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Haven, on the east side of Bethel. And he spake unto them, saying, Go up and view the country. And the men went up and they viewed it. And they returned to Joshua and they said unto him, Let not all the people go up. We don't have to send the whole army up to Ai. But let about two or three thousand men go up and smite Ai. Look at what they say. Let only two or three thousand men go up and smite. They didn't say go up and defeat. They said go up and smite Ai. Because they had this confidence that they were going to whoop their behinds. Amen? Amen. And look at what Joshua said in, in verse 4. So there went up thither of the people, only 3,000 men. And they ended up fleeing before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them about 30 and 6 men. They chased them from before the gate, all the way from the gate to Shebarim, and smote them in the going down. A lot of smiting going on here. <laughs> Therefore, the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Think about this for a minute. These guys went to that battle with confidence. And the basis of their confidence was they felt that God was on their side. And they looked at the numbers of the folks in Ai and they said, you know what? We only need two or 3,000 people to get this job done. We don't need to send the whole army. Just send two or 3,000 soldiers and we will smite them. But the exact opposite happened. Instead of smiting them, they got smitten. And why did this happen? Let's look at Joshua uh, chapter 7 verse 10. And the Lord said unto Joshua, get thee up. Why are you laying down here crying? Israel has sinned and they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing and have also stolen and dissembled also. And they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore, the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore, except you destroy the accursed thing from among you. So Joshua is crying, moaning, whinging, Lord, why me? Lord, you promised. Lord, this is not the way it was supposed to be. This is not what we thought would happen. This is not what we expected. So he's lying on his face, he's crying, he's moaning. And the Lord is like, my friend, get up. The reason why you guys are in this mess is because you did something you ought not to have done. And Joshua sets up a committee, they do an investigation, and this is what happens in verse 20. They find a guy called Achan, and they get him to confess. And this is what Achan said. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw, don't you know say, when he saw? When he saw. When he saw amongst the spoils, I love this expression, a goodly Babylonish garment. A goodly Babylonish garment. You know what that means? That is the premier designer of the time. Right. They are Ferragamo or they are Tom Ford. Amen? Right. This is not Calvin Klein. Amen? This is, <laughs> this is you know, this is the, 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 the creme de la creme. You know, this is your bespoke Savile Row garment. Amen? Some of you don't know what that is. Okay. You're too young. Wow. Okay. A goodly, don't you say a goodly Babylonish garment? <laughs> kind of like what you're wearing right now. No, don't tell them that. I'm just kidding. So, Achan saw a goodly Babylonish garment, 200 shekels of silver, a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, and then he goes, then I coveted them and I took them. And behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver is under it. 
This morning, I just want to talk a little bit about the lust of the eyes. You see, lust, like we defined last week, is simply a very strong desire. A very strong and intense desire. So the lust of the eyes simply is a strong and intense desire that starts out from what we see or from what we look at. Amen? The Bible says Achan saw some goodly Babylonish garments. Maybe he was watching TV and he saw an ad flash before his eyes. He saw some silver, he saw some gold, and he was gripped by an overwhelming desire to own what he saw. And that desire eventually culminated in the loss of life for 36 men. And it didn't end there. Even Achan himself lost his life. I'm sure we'll all agree that we live in a very materialistic world. The world that we live in, across the board, not just in America, but in Africa and Asia, in Europe, the world is driven by the acquisition of material things. The desire to possess more, more stuff. Now, I want us to be clear. The problem is not with owning stuff. The problem is with when that desire becomes the, the propellant of our life. When that desire is what drives us. Most of us have more than enough. We're always praying for abundance. But you need to stop praying for abundance and look in your refrigerator. You have more food in there than you can eat. You have more clothes in your closet than you can wear. You have more shoes than you need. But we want what? We want more. And every day we pray for what? For more. How many feet do you have? How many blouses or skirts or shirts can you wear at a time? You know, God convicted me recently. I was, I was in my closet, right? And I was looking in, at my suits. Yeah, which I haven't worn, by the way, in a while. And I had a row of suits. And all of them looked exactly alike. <laughs> it was either navy blue, a little under navy blue, or black, or charcoal, or gray, or navy blue with stripes, or black with stripes. They looked all the same. But guess what? We want more. The shoes look the same, but we want more. How many suits can you wear? How many shoes can you wear? How many bags can you carry? Listen, a red bag, a brown bag, and a black bag, and you're good. Hallelujah. Some of us have a closet for our shoes alone. A closet as big as some people would consider that a house. And what? We want more. You know, I don't know if this has ever happened to you before. You just lay down in your bed and you're thinking to yourself, oh Lord, if I won the lottery. Anybody ever have? Has anybody... I know some people are judging me now, but I'm going to pray for some liars here. So you lay down in your bed, wishing for the lottery. I think, you know, I don't want to be greedy. I just, let me just win the little scratch, scratch off, you know, uh, one million or, or, or two million. Then you start calculating all the things you buy. Then before you know what, you're like, okay, if I buy one May back, if I upgrade my kitchen, you know, there's no need, let me just buy a new house. Then you're thinking, shopping spree, Fifth Avenue, and it's gone. Oh, college fund too. Now, you see the thing about college? Okay, let's not talk about college. Uh, but, but you see, all of a sudden, that one or two million is not enough anymore. Then you want five million. And then that's not enough anymore. The reality is that once you get... Many of us are earning more than we ever imagined. Many of us, I, I, I mean, I, I come from the west coast of Africa, the west coast of the west coast of Africa. My first salary was 7,000 Naira. Naira, if you convert that into dollars, how much is that? 
I'm sorry? 25, 20 bucks. I earned 20 bucks. Can I tell you the truth? When I got my first paycheck, I was like, thank you, Jesus. Bless the Lord. Now, I earn way more than that. But we want more. If anybody had told me that, Femi, a day will come where you will earn the equivalent of $1,000, I'd have been like, you're dreaming. But we're here in the middle of our dreams, and we still want more. Where does it end? One house is not enough anymore. Now you need a summer home in the south of France. And it has to be in the south of France, not the east of France. It has to be in the south of France. No terrorists there. <laughs> Thank you. Please say it again. Uh, I didn't say that. You know, you need, you need a summer home in the south of France, a, a penthouse in, in New York, a, a beach home in Malibu. Somebody's receiving it over there. Get out of Babylon. You know, a mansion in the Hamptons, yeah? You know, and, and you have to have a mansion in your village. If you don't have a mansion in the village, you have not arrived. And it's not enough that you have one car. Now you need not two cars, but you need a car to take to church. This one is just for church. Then you need another one for work. Because you don't want to put miles on the church car. All right. Then you know what? Just a nice drop top convertible for you and your wife. Yeah? And then a separate car to go for shopping. Where does it end? You know, another word for all of this? Greed. Greed. The world is driven by greed. We were talking about this yesterday. We went to Top Golf and we're talking about what some people were doing. The only way you can describe it is greed. When you have so much more than you possibly need. And many of us don't realize that that is what drives us. An intense desire to acquire more. Jesus Christ was very clear in the book of Luke chapter 12 verse 15. He says, beware. Church, you know, we say beware. Say, guard against every kind of greed. Life is not measured by how much you own. Yet we measure our lives by how much we own. And when, and, and you know what, can I be honest with you? If we only measured our lives by how much we owned, it, it wouldn't be so bad. But we measure our lives by how much our neighbor owns. So it is not enough that I have a great car. I look at what my neighbor has and I judge my life based on what my neighbor has. And that intense desire then becomes covetousness. And there are many problems with covetousness. It will rob you of happiness. It will cause problems in your relationships. In James chapter 4, the Bible says some people will scheme and kill to get what they don't have. And it will make you resentful. The biggest and most dangerous problem with a life driven by greed is that you get distracted from God's purpose for your life. The shiny things in other people's lives then become a distraction. And you're never satisfied with what you have. The lust of the eyes will take our attention away from what God has in stock for us. And it will turn our attention to God's plan for the lives of the people around us. There's an expression we use a lot. We talk about destiny even though destiny is not scriptural. But let's just use it for a minute. You take your eyes off your own destiny to be looking at someone else's destiny. You take your eyes off your own path and you're busy looking at someone else's path. And the problem, like I was saying in the first service, is not that we are not blessed. We are blessed. We are living in houses we could never have imagined we would ever live in. We have food, so much food that we throw it away. Some of us are so, we're so full 
that we go to a restaurant and they give us uh, the, the to-go packs and we're like, you know, I don't eat, I don't eat, I don't, I, I don't eat, I, no, 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 I'm sorry, I don't eat, I don't eat, I don't, I don't do that. I, I can't eat to-go. If I eat it, I can't eat leftovers. Really? You can't eat leftovers. Some of us are wearing clothes that we could never imagine we would afford. We're driving cars that we used to see in the magazines and yet we want what more? If, 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 if we were not blessed, I would understand. If you were eating out of trash can, you know, I would understand. But you're not. And the problem with this is that we have so much. Yeah? Then we now have the audacity to say to God, God, why have you done this to me? Why have you not blessed me? God, why am I the only person that has one car? You see, and it's not just material things. It's also relationships. You know, there are folks here who think that once they get married, they'll be happy. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Hmm? Let me tell you something. I was telling the first service, I, there's this little thing that I do. Please don't be offended. I love laughing at single folks after they get married. See, because this is what happens. When, 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 when single people come to you and are like, Pastor, Pastor, I'm sad. I'm God, this weekend. After all these years, I'm still alone. I'm getting older. Lord, how far, how long? And I tell them, calm down. Enjoy your life. They're like, Pastor, it's because you are married. Then they get married. And they're back in my office complaining about their husband and their wife. Once they come, I just laugh. I say, did I not tell you? See, when you're single, you have problems. There are problems with being single. When you get married, you just exchange those problems <laughs> for another set of problems. But if you think that marriage will solve your problems, keep on living. You will find out quickly. <laughs> they say love is blind. Marriage will open your eyes. <laughs> Quick. Quick. And many of us are sitting down here thinking that if I get a better car, I'll be happy. If I get married, I'll be happy. If you're not happy now, your car will not make you happy. And if you're not happy single, I promise you, you'll be miserable married because now there's someone else adding to your unhappiness. I married the most beautiful woman in the world. Calm down. I married the nicest woman in the world, yes. but she's a human being. Yes. When she married me, she used to talk about tall, dark, and handsome, the man of her dreams, the knight in shining armor. But you know, sometimes the knight will take off the armor. And when he does, what do you got? A man from Igbao Doikiti. But guess what? You're sitting down there looking at other people's lives and crying to God about what he hasn't done for you. And so you jump into things you're not supposed to be in. You carry burdens and debt you're not supposed to carry simply because your eyes are driving you. And the world stirs it up. They, they stir it up. You know, have you ever watched an advert with a couple fighting? No, they're always happy together. <laughs> Have you ever seen an advert with somebody eating food and they were just too full? No, they always just, you know, they make it seem like the more you get, the happier you will be. And that is why many of us are frustrated because guess what? We have tied our happiness to the acquisition of these things. And then we get those things and we're not happy. So what? We want more. Maybe if I had more. I will finally be happy. Maybe if I had a bigger house, I will finally be happy. Maybe if I had more money, I'll finally be happy. Maybe if I was married, I'll be finally be happy. Maybe if I have children, I'll finally be happy. Maybe when they go to college, I'll finally be happy. <laughs> when, me, when they get married, I'll be happy. Maybe when they have children, I'll be happy. Maybe when my grandchildren marry, I'll be happy. Trust me, 
that happiness boat is sailing away from you. We're always looking at how the grass is greener on the other side. It's not. It's the same grass. You know, we see all of these things that other people have. We, we see these adverts selling us a lie. And we keep asking, God, why are you not giving me more? God, it's not fair. It's not fair. How can, I, how can you be so mean to me? All you have done is giving me a job. That's all you've done for me. All you have done is, is make sure that I, I have more than enough food. All you have done is a roof over my head. And a nice one for that matter. All you have done is giving me a husband. That's all you've done for me. How dare you? But that is what drives the world. The acquisition of more. When we see it, we want it. It is what drove Achan. He said he saw goodly Babylonish garments. Have you ever bought a garment and you thought this garment would just make your life? And then you wear it. And you feel yourself for like five minutes. But it's 24 hours in the day. And then you take it to the dry cleaner and they tell you how much you have to pay. <laughs> and you calm down quick. But that, that is what the world tells us. You know, I, I drive a very nice car to the glory of God. Amen. A German machine. Very nice car. But, <laughs> plenty. But you know what? You know what I realized? When I got that car, I thought, finally... Finally, God has settled me. Because in my wildest imaginations, I never thought I would get a car like that. Honestly speaking, I thought, you know what, if God blesses me, maybe just a Mercedes Benz or just a BMW. <laughs> You know, I used to drive a Nissan Bluebird. Those guys remember that car. A Nissan Bluebird. And then I drove a Volvo where the steering and the wheels did not talk. That means... Oh. Can, you, can you see how handsome I was before I got married and before I had children? Before all my dreams, I put the picture down. Don't, I, I don't want you guys to get distracted by my good looks. Hallelujah. But, but you, see, you see, the point I'm trying to make is this. Yeah? Now I got this car. The car that was even beyond my... You know how they say God is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, over and above... You see, God did exceedingly abundantly over and above my wildest imaginations. And I'm driving in that car. And I'm feeling, God, you are so good. And then somebody pulls up next to me in a Fisker. I, I, I step on the, the, the pedal and goes, vroom, vroom. And he goes, vroom, vroom. <laughs> and I'm like, God, why? <laughs> and I'm like, God, when? And God is like, what's wrong with you? And that is what God is saying to many of us. What's wrong with you? How many clothes can you wear? How many cars can you drive? How many houses can you live in? We're so wrapped up in the desire for more, we cannot even enjoy today. We don't even enjoy what we have. People are married. They don't enjoy their wives because they don't have children yet. When the children come, trust me. Let me preach my sermon. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 says, we should run the race that has been set before us. Let us be clear. It is not that God does not want you to have nice things. I believe that God wants you to have nice things. But that should not be why you wake up in the morning. That should not be your purpose for living. The acquisition of more. I have nice things, and I'm grateful to God for those nice things. But when I wake up in the morning, I'm not thinking about how to get nice things. I'm thinking about how do I fulfill God's purpose for my life. Amen. 
When you chase God and chase purpose, he will add nice things to you. The world chases nice things and that becomes their purpose. God forbid that when I die, they will put on my gravestone, here lies Femi Omotayo. He owned a Porsche. <laughs> Wouldn't that be a waste of a life? Here lies so and so. He owned a bunch of stuff. Here lies so and so. He owned the house. Who cares? Your children will sell it <laughs> and spend the money. And if you don't raise them right, they will burn the money uselessly. But imagine if that is your purpose in life. Just to gather money. What a waste of a life. I would rather they said on my gravestone, here lies Fabian Motayo. He touched lives. He changed lives. He made a difference in his generation. He fulfilled God's purpose for his life. A man of God called Miles Monroe died recently. When he died, nobody talked about what he owned. Nobody talked about what he owned. All they talked about was what he did. The impact he made. When you die, and I know that a lot of us here are young, so we don't think we will die. Newsflash, you will. You cannot reject it. <laughs> what will they say about you? Here lies a gentleman who lived for 80 years. And all he has to show for it, a mansion in the village, one in the south of France. Come on. That is a Babylonian mindset. It is time for us to get out of it. Don't buy clothes that you don't need. We have clothes in our closet we haven't worn in a year. Give them away. There are people who need it. Assignment. When you get home, dig in your closet. Some of us, it may not take us long. Some of us may be at it for a week. <laughs> but go through your stuff. If you haven't worn it in a year, give it to goodwill. Yeah? Give it away. Before you buy another blouse, give one away. Before you buy another pair of shoes, give one away. Let's move out of this mentality that more is better. Take a break from shopping until the end of the year. <laughs> until it's time. No, seriously. The next shopping you go on. No, no, no. I'm serious. Not Black Friday. Buy the people that you love. One, one, not five, one. One present, enough. And if you don't have anybody, stay at home and be grateful that you don't have to spend money. <laughs> I'm serious, I'm almost done. I'm serious. If you are going to the stores over the next four months, let it be you're going to buy food. Before you even go and do groceries, finish the food in your refrigerator. And the one in your pantry. We have stuff that is expiring. Eat it first before you buy more. And you'll be surprised how blessed you are. Some of us may not need to spend a penny except on gas till December. We have enough food. We have enough clothes. Your gas and utilities and your rent or mortgage. <laughs> but other than that, you don't need to go to McDonald's. You have enough food. I say, Pastor, it's, it's boring. And you are crying that God has not blessed you. So your, your, what you eat is not, by, is, is not by compulsion, it's by choice. Then, then, then stop moaning and, and, and whining. Just be grateful. Stop saying God hasn't done anything for you. Just be grateful. Amen? Amen? In closing, the Bible says in Isaiah 26, verse 3, it says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed 
on him. Jesus Christ said, I have come that you may have life. And having that life, have it more abundantly. Not that I have come that you may have stuff. I've come that you may have life. It is time for us to get our priorities together. It is time for us to get out of that Babylonian mindset. The church cannot be the world. God is not a means to an end. We have turned God into a vending machine. I'm going to talk about this next week. Some of the reasons why we are not getting answers to our prayers is what we are praying for. Some of the things you are praying for, you should not be praying for. I'm telling you the truth. You should be praying for God to, to reveal himself to you, to reveal his purpose to you, to reveal his plans for you. Instead, we're praying, God, give me more. The ones I've given you, what have you done with it? Oh, I'm, it has expired. I'm going to throw it away. Well, give me more. I want us to take a minute this morning and pray. And just say, Lord, help me. Get out of this mindset where I am so distracted. Where I am focused on the acquisition of material things. Father, we thank you and we bless you. Father, we give you praise. Almighty and ever living God, we commit each and every person that is here into your hands. Father, help us to be grateful for what you have given us, for where we are. Many of us are in difficult places. Many of us don't even have enough. Help us, Father, to get into the place that you have ordained for us. Take us, Father, into the place of our dreams. But, Father, when we get there, help us to be grateful. Help us to appreciate what you have done for us. Help us to get out of the Babylonian mindset that judges life by what we have, or even worse, what our neighbors have. That, Father, we may be your children. Help us to find our purpose in life. Help us to find that for which you have called us, that for which you made us. Thank you, Father. We bless you and we give you praise. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah.